Hey, Joey. I just wanted to know after, you know, your research, you know, do you reckon anyone's going to put any funny stuff in, in your cup of tea? Thanks. Love the podcast. <laughs> um... I could kill you quite easily, but I don't, because I'm not a killer. I was banging on the door, and the first thing he said, where are the documents? Do you want to know more? Me? Mm. Yeah. Hi, I'm Claire Weaver. I'm Investigations Editor at Listener, and I am joined by Joey Watson, who is the host of Secrets We Keep, Seasons 2, Nest of Traitors. Yep. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joey, tell us uh, in a nutshell what your podcast is about. Okay. How can I do this really quickly? Um, I learned that during the Cold War, Australia's biggest spy agency was penetrated by a mole. One of the spies had betrayed the country and started working for the Soviet Union, the KGB. They'd never been identified. The truth had been buried. So I set out to find them. And episode one has just dropped. Um, do you want to give us a little synopsis of what that's about? Sure. So the podcast is built in a world of deception, right? Um, so much of what happens in the podcast happens in the shadows. Uh, and I've gone into this world to try and dig things up. But what happens in episode one is probably the most public telling of anything to do with the, the spy that betrayed Australia, the, the mole in ASIO. And it revolves around the Russian Orthodox Church in Canberra. In the 90s, uh, ASIO, I, I learned, got a tip-off uh, from an overseas spy agency that uh, was pretty comprehensive, basically saying that inside the spy agency there was uh, a mole and that they'd been operating for quite some time um, and that they'd been leaking um, secrets, not just uh, uh, Australian secrets, but the secrets that Australia shared with its allies like America and the US, uh, sorry, the US and the UK. Um and uh, they, they were also given these two clues, or at least they managed to piece together these two clues, that the mole had a five-letter surname and a wife that also worked for the organization. Uh, they brought in the AFP to investigate. Um, the, it was decided that ASIO couldn't be, shouldn't be in a position where it could be accused of investigating itself. Um, so the, opposite, the, the AFP started an uh, operation called Liver, um, which is named after the organ that um, I believe clears toxins from the body's blood supply. So I don't know whether that was deliberate or not, but very poetic, very evocative. And it was one of the biggest operations in AFP history. Like 200 cops were brought in. They had access to like warrants to install cameras all around Canberra. They, they took over properties to try and survey, uh, survey people that they thought might be uh, suspects. And eventually, the, the way the story goes is the, uh, the AFP operation landed on this one guy, and he was a um, congregant at the Russian Orthodox Church in Canberra, and his name was George Sadil, S-A-D-I-L. George didn't have a wife in ASIO, but his sister, Tanya, had been a respected operator for a long time. Um, the AFP surveilled him for quite a few months. They set up in the house uh, across. He, uh, they set up in a house across the road from where he lived. They cleared the bushes um, to set up cameras that were fixed on his living room. They installed a camera above his desk at, at, at in, in the ASIO headquarters, and slowly um, they it became apparent that George had actually been taking documents home. Uh, when they realized that he had been taking documents home and that they had that they'd been sc sort of scattered around his living room, they started to focus in on him and focus in on what he was doing at church. And this is when they found discovered that he had a relationship with a Russian trade official named Vyacheslav Tataranov. Um, now, Tataranov had done two postings of Australia. Um, curiously, George, uh, given that his job was translator at ASIO, had listened in to a lot of the conversations that they'd been tapping. So he kind of knew Tataranov quite well, which is like re really strange. But then Tataranov showed up at church and they became mates. Did Tataranov know that George Sedilla had been listening to him or was that all... <laughs> uh, according to George, no. According to George, um, Tataranov never even knew that George had worked for ASIO. But it is like a strange sort of framing for a friendship, right? They became really good friends. Um, they got along, <laughs> yeah, they got along really well, like Easter Sunday sort of thing. And George eventually became the godfather to Tataranov's son um, because 
uh, they all wanted to be baptized into the Russian Orthodox Church. So that's the sort of setup um, to, to what, what happens in episode one. Um, it goes to a committal proceeding, but soon things start to fall apart. Right. Excellent. It's a good sell. Thank you. So um, this is Nest of Traders Declassified. And what this is, is that we go behind the scenes of each episode and have a chat about what it's all about, um, what goes into making the podcast, things that made the cut and those that didn't and why. Um, and then maybe some tips and tricks on how you got people to talk to you or, or how you got information. Um, and it's also an opportunity for our listeners um, to ask some questions, which um, you can answer at the end of each video. So let's start off uh, with some questions. Why are you so obsessed with the Cold War? And tell me in a way that's not boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I answer why I'm obsessed with the Cold War, let me tell you why I'm obsessed with history in general. Um, I think that nothing in the present, nothing in the world that we live in is inevitable. Um, at different times, forces um, had to create things that now seem permanent and inevitable and just like part of the way that we, we live our lives. Um, you know, whether that be the way we construct like families or whether it be our relationship between us and our government or um, anything like that, even the world map, like things like that, things that we just take for granted. Um, and the, the Cold War, in terms of historical episodes that have dictated the way the present looks, there's really, it's really unparalleled. I mean, it occupied like 40 years of the last de decade, right? F sorry, four decades of the last century. And it defined the world in a way that I don't think we can even understand today. Like people weren't even, um, people were so fearful of nuclear annihilation, the reality that at one day the Soviet Union, like a nuke would drop from the sky, that they, weren't, they were deciding not even to have kids, like the way that people might with, um, with climate change today. And that then affected the political dynamics in each, in each of the two camps. So in the West, who said, no, we're not the Soviet Union, we're not autocracy, we're defined by freedom. All these like political movements started that were just based ar around that, things like civil rights that were defined like in opposition to not being the Soviet Union and not being an autocracy. And I think that that's really important because it, it really creates the world today. Another level to, another way to answer that would be, um, I love uh, spies. And um, I find spies endlessly fascinating. I always have. And the Cold War was not only a time when like spies became part of global politics, the way countries related to each other, but it, they, it also became part of culture. Like, you know, James Bond was born out of this era. Um, John le Carre started writing spy books. Um, the whole like understanding of espionage and the way we think about spies today and everything that came after that is all, um, all came out of the Cold War and Cold War culture. And I think that that's um, really important. It's kind of like set me up for what I've looked at today. But you're, you're a young person, so you don't remember that fear that people were living under um, during the Cold War. So um, why do you think, unlike some, maybe some of your peers, you were so interested in that and, and realise that and, and almost feel that? Because I, I think that it's like, it's easy to see like the past as two dimensional and see the, the present as, as three dimensional because we're, we're experiencing it. Right. But to me, it's amazing that like the, the people in the past had real anxieties and that created, and, and, it, and it informed the way that they acted and the way that they behaved and the way that they related to each other. And yeah, I feel like when I, when I look at that, it kind of helps me understand the present and helps me understand the anxieties of today. And now with the work you've done about real life spying, um, looking back at the James Bond and the John le Carreys, how accurate are those portrayals of spy world? <laughs> people often say, um, people like to um, debunk the myth of James Bond. They say, oh, no, 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 spying isn't like James Bond at all. It's, it's like bureaucrats. It's bureaucrats just going around being bureaucrats, watching things, processing large amounts of information. I'd say that that's not true entirely. Um, I do know some James Bond-like spies. I know people who are ridiculously physically fit and ridiculously smart, usually in the sciences, and have spent their lives posted overseas um, doing uh, things that involve high levels of action, um, sometimes in, um, 
yeah, sometimes in conflict zones, sometimes in potential conflict zones, and they've spent decades of their lives undercover. And are they still active now? Is that something that's still happening now, even though we have, you know, digital spying and AI and all other tools that, that, you know, we didn't have back then? (laughs) Well, while Nest of Traders doesn't go into the present, I'm sure that there still is a human intelligence element in the way that uh, Australia does its investigations and retrieves information over t- overseas, human intelligence, as opposed to um, signals intelligence, which is which like we just get everything from everyone's phones. Um, but yeah, and in, in, in t- to answer your question, I think the typical spy today, even though there are James Bond like spies or the, the typical spy, particularly in the cold war is um, not a, uh, action thriller style bond figure it's also not a bureaucrat it's kind of more peculiar than that these are people that spend their lives kind of living a lie and dealing with lies um, as in they are trying to overcome deception from the other side and um, whether that involves action or whether it involves just trying to work through masses of information collected overseas or in Australia and trying to create a picture of what's true and what's not when your opposition might be deliberately uh, laying traps. Um, it would make you I, very suspicious. I, I, yeah, I, I think it induces like a kind of almost a sense of, um, yeah, a, a sense of deep paranoia. Um, that kind of comes with the job. And I think that even retired spies who I'm quite close with now around Australia and even internationally, I think that they carry that with them. Um, It's hard to shake after decades. And to me, that psychology is even more interesting than the James Bond thing because it's... um, it's kind of hard to grapple with. Mm, yeah. Mm. Now, zooming back out, um, for the people who didn't live through the Cold War, what was it about the KGB that made um, Russia so scary to the West or USSR so scary to the West? Mm. So the KGB, um, for those that don't know, were the um, Committee for State Security within um, the Soviet within the Soviet Union. They'd gone by various different names, but they'd been founded basically from the Bolshevik revolution that brought communism to Russia ba- back in 1917. And they operated both internally and externally, which already makes them unique. So in Russia, they were like a political police. They went after dissent and they did horrible, horrible things to a lot of people in pursuit of that goal, um, the least of which was exile to Siberia or... I mean, it gets a lot. It gets a lot worse from there, and that's been documented by many historians over the years. But they also uh, had one of the best, like, tra- spy training systems in the world, and they managed to use um, the the vulnerabilities of the West that are kind of implicit in uh, uh, the Western style open democracies. It's easy for people to operate in those environments and retrieve information because we share information with each other and they managed to build this network of spies that went all around all around the world a lot of them were focused on retrieving information but then in many instances they were also involved in going after dissenters abroad or uh, achieving political uh, objectives through through violence or um yeah, sometimes doing it um, covert, covertly, and the the West was also um, also did that. I mean, like you don't need to go that far or spend that much time on Google um, to find out about uh, like all of the CIA operations all around the world that potentially they were involved in overthrowing this um, democratically elected government there or this democratically elected government here. But I guess it was the fact of the KGB being attached to an autocratic state that had absolutely no oversight of the rule of law that meant that they could go to extreme lengths to carry out their objectives. So they were very effective and very ruthless by the sounds of things. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the spies that I've spoken to about the KGB, um, the KGB spies that were posted to Australia, um, they say that they were actually some of the best in the world. And there's evidence of... Um, the KGB spies that we do know about in Australia going on to be posted to America and doing incredible damage in terms of recruiting people within America's intelligence agencies or um, stuff like that. Yeah. 
Fascinating world. Um, so, Joey, you told us earlier about George Sedil. He was a suspect and his case went to a committal proceeding. Um, he gave you something. Uh, what is it? And can you tell us about it? Yeah. Well, the context of this is that you'll remember that um, when we were investigating the committal proceedings of George Sedil, we attempted to get the documents and when we did, there was almost nothing there. That's right. After all these emails and all these months went by, backwards and forwards. Yeah, we'd even paid some money at yep. some stage. The attachment arrives. We double click. We open it. <laughs> it's like one page. Which is very disappointing um, from an investigation point of view and in terms of trying to tell the story of this, um, or, of what happened to George Shadil and, yeah, and in terms of chronicling ASIO's mole hunt, given that that was the most public telling of that mm. whole event. So it basically left us in a, in a position where there was like n no records. So all that we could rely on was the like memory of people involved and news reports at the time. But because a lot of what had happened had happened in closed court and there were like differ differing levels of interest over time, it, it's incredibly inconclusive and people's memories are famously unreliable. I mean, I spoke to a lot of people um, who were involved in the case and even within them, like even with speaking to them, there were contradictions amongst them. So, mm. um, it left us in a bit of a tricky position, but then I got possibly, uh, I was given, um, in, in my second or third, um, so I, I like over the course of the investigation, I spent a lot of time having, um, Poroshki with George Shadil, which is, a a, a, a like a steamed bun. Um, a Russian, um, I don't know if it's a Russian delicacy. I think it's like, it's like more like street food and, uh, uh, but really, really delicious. Um, some of them, they've got lots of different fillings. Like some of them have, have uh, berries or some of them have mince. I was going to say there was a meat one. Yeah, yep. there was a meat one. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but then George got out this like big gold box and, um, he sort of put it on the table and from it, he retrieved this book. I feel like I'm in a cooking show that uh, like this is Here's the one, one we this prepared, is one earlier. prepared earlier to pull it out of the oven, <laughs> um, um, which is amazing. Like, f so for every day of the trial, it says here, George, George G. Sedilnikov, which is his like Russian name. Sedil is an anglicization of that name, October, 1993 to March, 1994. And, um, he's basically done a handwritten. So while he was sitting in court, done a handwritten transcript of everyone who had appeared on the stand to give evidence against him or for him and uh, how um, the cross-examination had subsequently gone. Um, and it's just like mind-blowing because I, I don't know whether it's just because I don't see handwriting much anymore. <laughs> it's beautiful handwriting, like, isn't it? You know, like even going through ASIO files, they were all done on... Um, um, <laughs> yeah, they were typewriter. Typewriter. <laughs> One of those old-fashioned machines. Yeah. Oh, man, that's, that's embarrassing. Yeah, they were all done on type typewriters. And, um, yeah, so it's like this is r just ridiculous. Like this yeah. perfectly written, perfectly handwritten chronicle. Of, and contemporaneous record because it's from the time. Everything that happened. Now, like, I've got to um, put a caveat on this. Uh, George Sedil was um, under suspicion. There was a reason that he was um, in court. Um, Ezio did suspect, and the AFB did suspect or alleged that he was the Russian mole inside Ezio. Of course, that case eventually fell over. Um, the evidence was not substantial. and So this is a subjective account? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I yeah. guess we have to say that it was, even though it looks like a, it looks like a complete chronicle. But, you know, this was written by George Sedil and given to me by George Steele, even if it was con contemporaneous to, to the events that happened. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, an amazing document, right? It is. It's beautiful. Yeah. And so, so much information and so many names. So this, as far as we have, without any of the court records existing, assuming they've been destroyed, um, this is the closest thing we have to a actual chronicle of the events that happened when ASIO brought someone into court and accused them of being a traitor. So you gave us a really important bit of information there. Uh, you had Poroshki. Now, food plays a very important uh, part in this investigation. So I've got a clip to play now. Meeting the dean of the church, I didn't want to come empty-handed. I want your lemon slice if you, <laughs> if you can you. eat it. 
I had one blueberry ricotta piroshki, the other was beef. I can confirm they were delicious. So, Joey, you bring or consume uh, treats a lot. Uh, what's all this about? Well, I ask a lot of my sources um, when I meet them. Um, and generally, I want it to be as natural as possible. I mean, one of the things that I love about being a journalist is I get to spend a lot of time with people um, talking usually about topics that I'm obsessed with. And particularly when they're older people and they've lived through a lot and we're trying to chronicle history, it's like I'm asking them for their lived experience. So um, in saying that, I feel like I could show up with a microphone and just be like, talk to me. Or I could do something for them and either bake some treats or if I'm on the road, buy some treats and bring them. And then um, it just makes for a much nicer, um, more natural interaction. I'd also say operating in a world that's built on deception becomes exhausting. Right. Um, and makes me very hungry. <laughs> uh, and it means I can spend a lot, a much <laughs> longer time um, talking to people and hearing their stories. And um, yeah. Yeah. I so guess it's, it's good it's, for you and it's good for the interviewee. And food is this universal language, or it, it, it lubricates communication. Yeah. And trust, maybe. I, 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 think, I think definitely. It's like once you've broken bread with someone, I think your relationship with them completely changes. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, there are different ways of doing journalism. I know some people, um, some journalists uh, tend to just go a bit, go in a bit harder, a bit faster, but the beauty of audio for me and the beauty of like long form narrative investigative podcasting is that we have the time to spend with people. Sometimes we have the time to go back again and again and again. Um, and um, yeah. And to, to do that in a way that feels really natural and nice is, uh, is, uh, is really, yeah, is, is much more valuable, I think for them and well, for me and hopefully for them as well. Um, and have you got a trademark dish? you I mean, obviously it would change if you're speaking to maybe a Russian person or someone else, but, but what's your, your, your personal trademark? Dish? Yeah. I was once told, um, by a, a very senior journalist who's been very helpful to me that, um, a good thing to bring would be poppy seed cake, but I wonder if, <laughs> I wonder if that is because the, uh, the poppies, poppy seed, maybe the poppies, some yeah, poppy opium seeds, opiates, the... <laughs> lift people up, tell me everything. Yeah. It makes sense, Joey. <laughs> anyway, I don't really like poppy seed cake. Um, and I've never made poppy seed cake, but I do have a, a very quick and easy lemon slice recipe that seems to be generally pleasing to everyone. It goes with tea, um, very nicely because they're little slices. And that's what you bought in episode one for, uh, father from. Fa yeah. For father Alexander. Yeah. I've got a habit of bringing lemon slice to speak to sources. Okay. I thought you were going to say priests, but sources. To, to bring lemon <laughs> slice to priests. No, but yeah, I guess I've got a habit of bringing, um, lemon slice to people that I meet in when I'm inquiring about things and investigating things. So right. yeah. That's Smart. That, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> or maybe it's just a nice thing to do. Yeah. I think I think it's in, it's important to treat people well. And then yeah, and then everyone just kind of has a better time. More insights from your uh journalistic process, Joey. Uh you wrote a letter uh for this episode. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So letters are kind of like emails, but they're like physical, right? Um, and you have to take them to a post office and put a stamp on them and they, they just go wherever. It's like magic. They just get somehow end up uh, at the destination that you write onto the back of the envelope. It's, um, it's <laughs> amazing. No, no. I, look, I, I have gotten into letter writing. Um, I think it's the best way to I, there's two ways there's there's two answers to this question and one of them is just like a general thing and the other one is espionage specific specific the general one is that um uh if you're asking people to talk about something that's difficult uh whether it be for personal reasons or because it m might be sensitive in a national security setting it's nice not to just kind of hit them with something. It's nice to give them something that they can hold, that they can think about. Um, you can be really clear about who you are and what your intentions are. 
And uh, I don't know, there's something about, it's old school, but there's, I, th I think that there's something nicer about that. I just, a lot of the time, like I ask people to do a, a lot of things and it would be weird. It would be weird being approached by a journalist. And I don't think journalists think about that that much, but it's a soft approach, isn't it's, it? It's a soft gives, approach. Yeah. They can have time to think about it. But if I'd been involved in something that was the subject of journalistic inquiry, I'd probably prefer to have something that I could consider. I could put it on the bench. I could think about. Then there's a um, espionage answer to this, which is that, so there was like, a, there was a Royal Commission, a big investigation into um, Australia's spy agencies in the 70s. And one of the recommendations of that commission was that ASIO shouldn't be allowed to intercept mail. I feel like that was, that's already like a very dated recommendation. It's strange. I mean, I don't know um, why there's something like, it's like the sanctity of mail. There's something noble about it and that it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be allowed to be intercepted. Um, it seems like very arbitrary, but I guess it was like indicative of a culture at the time where, and I, and I feel like spies, especially older spies, retired spies still, still might feel that the mail is in some way secure more secure. And, you know, I have no doubt today. I mean, I, I don't know this for certain. This hasn't been verified to me, but I'm sure that within the current suite of legislation that governs ASIO now, I'm sure that they would be able to get warrants to look at letters. But with all of the technology they have to, um, you know, take data off phones or record people through phones or anything like that, I imagine that letters would actually be quite difficult because especially if you put a bit of sticky tape around it, yeah, uh, it would be incredibly hard to read a letter without it becoming at least slightly apparent that um, you have, with. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that it's been tam tampered with. So, and it's yeah. outside of digital surveillance, which is actually amazing when you think about it. Cause like you just said, everything that we do digitally can be, we live a footprint and it can be found out later on. Yeah, so. totally. Yeah. So that's the letter writing. Excellent. So you're going to keep Australia Post's letter department uh, in business for that, now. That, that's right. Joey hunting spies <laughs> and online shopping. Okay, finally, we've got a listener question that's come in uh, from Shane, and he wants to know if you worry about getting funny stuff put into your tea. Hey, Joey. I just wanted to know after, you know, your research, you know, do you reckon anyone's going to put any funny stuff in, in your cup of tea? Thanks. Love the podcast. <laughs> um, I will be honest. Like, you know how, like, how you know how, what I was saying earlier about um, how being in like existing in the world of spycraft, like many of these former spies have for decades does tend to induce a sense of paranoia. Um, in addition to be being warned at the beginning of this investigation that this was the sort of story that sent people insane. I was also warned that like ASIO will come after you and um, bad things might happen to you. Um, so very, very early on, I kind of forced myself into a meeting with a very, very senior former spy, someone who had been at the very near the very top of the um, tree more recently than the Cold War, more recently than um, like the the period in which this podcast is set. And I made him kind of guarantee me, or at least I said, put my investigation to him and put my anxieties to him. And uh, he guaranteed me um, very kindly, even though he obviously doesn't believe a lot of this history should come out and he has his reasons for this. Um, he said that these are legitimate journalistic inquiries and in a democracy like Australia, um, you're lucky, um, but you will be able to proceed without anything bad happening to you. And um, that did um, appease a lot of my anxieties early on. Like we are fortunate in Australia that we are able to do things like that. Um, that, like, that we are able to make inquiries even about the world of spycraft. Obviously, in Putin's Russia today, let alone during the Cold War, it would have been far, far, far more difficult. Um, Putin does have a track record of going after journalists, certainly spies that would speak to journalists and say something to, who would say, that, that would say things that would be considered treacherous or uh, uh, treasonous, sorry, or go against the regime. Um, wouldn't have m much luck at all. Uh, I think Shane mentioned p poisons. There is a track record of um, poisons kind of 
all around the world, even as recently as uh, 2018. Um, that's the Salisbury the affair UK, yeah. yeah, in the UK. So, yeah, I would say that we're very lucky that I am safe from that in Australia. But I would also say that part of the this process and part of why I think this podcast is important is that that safety that we have is not to be taken for granted and comes from vigilance. And I think it's the role of journalists not just to kind of look at the institutions and be really happy and say, oh, that's great. We live in a democracy. Brilliant. Let's just um, go out and, and, and um, sing the praises of Australia and sing the praises of ASIO and, and um, you know, the great work they're doing. But to be perpetually um, probing um, and uh, skeptical and um, investigate you know what what's going on going on there i mean asio <laughs> i don't know wh whether it exists in australia but in the us that i've heard this um saying um thrown around it's like the new york times test like that spies need to ask themselves like if we were doing this and it did end up on the front page of the new york times tomorrow um how would it look like how would it look mm. and uh, i don't know how closely that's abided um in the US now or in Australia, I don't know. I'm sure that there's a lot going on. I'm sure they're complex cultures and I'm sure like any organization, let alone organizations that have to function in such strange environments, I'm sure bad things probably do happen. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there will be ASIO spies that might listen to this podcast and feel like it speaks truth to what happens within the organization today. Um, but um, that was a very long way of me answering the question that, <laughs> no, uh, I haven't been worried about being poisoned because I have been guaranteed that these, um, that these are legitimate uh, inquiries within a liberal democracy like Australia. And uh, let's hope that this podcast contributes to the culture of liberal democracy that allows us to make those sorts of inquiries um, for decades, centuries into the mm -hmm. future. And ASIO, if you're listening, leave Joey's tea alone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That would be great. And also ASIO, if you're listening, a five-star review would be fantastic. <laughs> so please subscribe. Mike Burgess, I love you. No, 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 no. Mike Burgess, um, love your work. Uh, yeah. I don't want to say five that. Five stars. Yeah. No, but Mike Burgess, please. Yeah. Five stars. Thanks. <laughs> I could kill you quite easily, but I don't, because I'm not a killer. I was banging on the door, and the first thing he said, where are the documents? Do you want to know more? Me? Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for watching Nest of Traders Declassified, where we take a look behind the scenes um, at creating season two of Secrets We Keep, Nest of Traders. If you made it this far, please be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to this channel and drop us a comment. Also, listen to the actual pod. Um, the links will be in the descriptions or just search for Secrets We Keep, Nest of Traders, wherever you get your podcasts.